Thanks, Kendra, and thanks to Elsie for uh, allowing me to be on the program today. It's definitely my pleasure to speak about uh, the use of probiotics and uh, food safety. It's really been the focus of my career. And today I was thinking, how long have I been studying probiotics? And I realized it's been 25 years that I have been doing this. And I was like, well, surely it can't be that long because I'm only 29, but no. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, we just get old really fast. But uh, definitely uh, something that, that I have a passion about and I enjoy studying the lactic acid bacteria, the good bacteria. I always tell people, you know, we focus really on the bad ones, but most of them are really, really good. And uh, just an overview of, you know, our lactic acid bacteria, they can be a number of different species and, and types. And uh, we spend a lot of time uh, characterizing them and naming them, and it, it gets really frustrating because the taxonomists changes, change the names and the species, and as our technology grows to identify them, uh, they do change, but usually they are gram-positive. They're non-spore-forming uh, cocci or uh, rods, and they usually grow anaerobically, but they can also survive in the presence of oxygen. These are just some basic characteristics that we look for. Uh, again, we call them the friendly bacteria, and uh, there's a number of ways they can have antagonism with our pathogens. They can uh, produce antimicrobial compounds such as uh, organic acids and bacteriosins. They can compete for nutrients and uh, minerals, and then if you're looking at uh, use uh, animal feeding uses, they can actually compete for adhesion sites in the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, these are just a few ways that we can get competition. Um, I also I'm a strong believer that we just don't know all the answers. We think as scientists, well, it's doing this, it's doing that, but there are some things that we just can't measure. And um, that really brings me to uh, a statement I just feel I have to make, is that there is an art to studying uh, probiotics and lactic acid bacteria. Uh, it's not, and, and it frustrates me as a scientist because we want to go X, Y, Z and have a hypothesis and, and test this, but there is really a, a strong amount of skill that is needed to be able to put these bacteria together and make them work. Um, Sometimes probiotics are um, get a bad rap, I guess, and it's like, the, the, it's nothing, it doesn't do anything, it's not beneficial. Well, there are literally thousands and thousands of strains out there, and some of them are not going to work. It's, that's, it's as simple as that. And as our first speaker mentioned, there is a very uh, systematic way to evaluate probiotics and to develop the ones that do the job that you want to do. Uh, in our case, we're looking at antagonism of pathogens, but then uh, on the market today, there are many that have health benefits and, and other beneficial factors. You have to select the bacteria for the job you want them to do. I was uh, fortunate to study under uh, Stan Gilliland at uh, Oklahoma State, the late Stan Gilliland. He was my advisor, and I would just call him one of the master artist of uh, lactic acid bacteria technology, and he uh, really taught me a lot about this. Right now, the art has been transferred to most of my graduate students who get to work with them on, in the lab on a daily basis. So uh, we know when we put these bacteria together, sometimes we get a really great synergistic effect, and they're more uh, inhibitory when we put them together. Sometimes when we put a combination together, they basically fight with each other and you get no effect. We've even seen uh, when you put them in a product that you create an environment that is more uh, beneficial for the pathogen to grow. So we might even have growth in there. So you have to be very careful in your screening and your research. Uh, as I've already mentioned, we need to select the strains uh, for the purpose. And, um, and then we have to remember there's a dose response. Uh, more doesn't always mean better, but uh, if you find something that works, and you go to a commercial application, you can't use it as a, at a tenfold, hundredfold lower dose and expect to get the same response. Yes, there's a cost benefit to using less, but less is not going to get you uh, the actual result that you're wanting. So um, that brings me to, I'm really summarizing 10, 25 years of work in uh, this presentation, so I'm just gonna hit the highlights. I'll start with pre-harvest applications. Uh, most of our applications are in the feed yard, and I realize these are not feed yard cattle, 
but um, they're my family's cattle, so I thought they were pretty, so I thought I'd put them up there. And, uh, and just to give, and I did that really because uh, people are, a lot of times people say pre-harvest, or what are you talking about? Well, basically in the live animal prior to going to slaughter or harvest. Um, one of the, the products and one of the, the projects that I spent a lot of my career on is developing uh, a pre-harvest product. And in 1997, I began my career at University of Nebraska. And it was uh, my first day on the job was the day of the Hudson ground beef uh, recall. And this, at the time, was the largest ground beef recall in history. And it was at the University of Nebraska. I was there as, as an extension food safety specialist, a new professor. And uh, basically, the state of Nebraska charged the scientists in Nebraska to come up with solutions to control E. coli. And so uh, with my training in lactic acid bacteria, we came up with, uh, started trying to develop a product to kill E. coli in cattle prior to slaughter. So we actually isolated 686 strains and screened them in the lab for a variety of factors. Again, our first speaker you know, gave you a list and just the whole uh, screening of those takes a tremendous amount of time and effort to come up with the strains that you actually want. Of those, about half of those did inhibit E. coli, but that's not the only thing we looked for. We looked at uh, commercial applications, antibiotic resistance, survival in rumen fluid, and pH survival, all of those. And we came up with four strains that we really liked and thought that we could have uh, some really good results with. Uh, we started out at this time uh, at Nebraska and we challenged uh, calves with E. coli 0157H7, fed these four strains to them to uh, see if we actually had quantitative reductions in the animal and how long the pathogen was shed in these challenged animals. We found that our controls shed the pathogen for the entire 60 days of the study, which is good. You are at least, you know, you have some shedding in your controls. And our treatments only shed the pathogen for three to seven days. And we actually had a three to five log reduction in the total uh, quantitative amount in the ones that were shedding. So we, we came to the conclusion, okay, hey, this might work. And we scaled this up to commercial studies. Uh, at that time, I actually moved to Texas Tech between this study and our first uh, large scale feedlot studies. And through a series of evaluation of these four cultures, we came up with one that was really the best that could be produced commercially. And over the years, um, in 2001, and then 2002, and three, and four, we actually uh, developed these, tested these in a feed, feedlot environment. Um, our red bar represents our, uh, our untreated animals, and these are in, like I said, commercial settings. These animals were not challenged. These were naturally occurring E. coli 0157H7 uh, strains that we found in our animals. And in general, over the years, about 50% reduction in the, the amount, which to me, that uh, animal going into the packing plant is going to reduce the risk. We're not eliminating it. Uh, as we've said, it's no silver there's no silver bullet to eliminate these pathogens, but this becomes the first step in the hurdle of the animal actually going to harvest. Uh, I think at the, uh, well, I'll go ahead to go to the next slide. We also looked at the quantitative reductions and we had about, um, you know, a two log reduction in the animals that did test positive. So not only were we, were we, were we reducing prevalence, we were reducing concentration of the pathogen in the positive samples. Uh, to date, the last time I counted, there's been about 47 different studies done uh, with this particular strain, uh, MP51. It is commercially available and it has a widespread adoption in the, the cattle industry. And we uh, consistently, we have done meta-analysis, we get about a 50 to 60 percent reduction in the animal and on the hides prior to harvest. Now, 
That brought us to 2012, where we did a study. Uh, at this time, we were doing a lot of work on salmonella prevalence in lymph nodes. And in the lymph nodes, we knew that salmonella was carried uh, and causing issues in ground beef. And, uh, and so we wanted to see if this might reduce pathogen prevalence in the lymph nodes. We had a large pen study. Uh, in a so this first uh, bar shows us a large pen results. We had about a 25% reduction of salmonella, but still you can see our lymph node prevalence was very high. And then our small pen study with cattle housed at our university feed yard, we had um, an 84% reduction in our uh, prevalence. So there is some indication that we can have salmonella reduction in those lymph nodes. In previous studies, we really were unable to measure any salmonella reduction in uh, the fecal or hide but, uh, samples, but we have were able to do that in the lymph nodes. And then also when we looked at the uh, CFU's program, we found a 90% reduction, but not a, you know, about a one log reduction in our total bacteria when we did a quantitative analysis. So to summarize that work, uh, really uh, feeding, and like I said, there's a dose response. So uh, feeding the 10 to the nine per head per day of animals uh, consistently reduced STEC 0157H7 in the feces and hides. Uh, we also saw reductions in our concentration and reduction in uh, lymph nodes. Uh, as I already mentioned, we had did not measure salmonella reduction in our feces and hides. And in all of these studies, we measured performance, uh, you know, meat quality, all of those things. There was no detrimental impact on performance of the animals and their growth and uh, the gain, weight gain, and, and all of feed conversion, all of those things. Uh, and in some cases, we actually had improvements in that. With this process of developing this product, uh, we learned a lot. And I worked very closely with Dr. Guy Lonregan at Texas Tech, and we were like, okay, we learned this from the development of the first product. Now it's time to really to go to the next generation of probiotics. And uh, we took what we learned in developing this first one and, and testing it, and we have uh, been working on a new next generation probiotic. And what we uh, really focused on was, uh, number one, the, the dosing, so a co the cost of the product, so we could speed it at lower doses, the efficacy against other pathogens, the impact on antibiotic resistance, uh, the ability to uh, detect it and verify that it was actually being fed at the concentrations it was being fed at. So um, we used our method again to systematically isolate different strains of lactic acid bacteria and uh, came up, I think we had about 300, close to 300 this time and did lab screening against various pathogens and lab media. And the, we found one that we really liked, we call it L28. And you can see uh, after 24 hours, so this is growth, so it, we had really high growth in here, or high numbers, but this was after 24 hours of growth, we had a very significant reductions of salmonella, E. coli 0157H7, and then uh, actually elimination of listeria. So we really had a multi-species uh, inhibition with this particular strain. And with that, uh, we have done a cattle feeding study. We wrapped this up in the, the spring of this year. And so we not only wanted to look at the pathogen reduction, we also wanted to look at using this to replace tylosin in the diet of cattle. Tylosin is fed to improve performance characteristics in the animal, and uh, you know if you took it out of the diet, what was going to happen? It is actually uh, right now it cannot be used unless it's prescribed now as a low dose antibiotic in cattle feeding systems. So we replaced the tylosin with the L28 to see what happened basically. So we had three treatments. We had uh, one with no uh, DFM or probiotic and uh, it had no subtherapeutic antibiotics and no onophores. This was our control. Then we had one with uh, moninsin, uh, which is now onophore, uh, tylosin, which was our monta uh, combination. And then we had our monpro combination, which was our probiotic. And we replaced the tylosin with the uh, L28 strain. So uh, if looking at the fecal pathogen prevalence, 
You can see that in our controls, we had about 35% positive salmonella. In our, uh, mon our tylosin monensin treatment, 25%, and then we had 15% in our uh, samples with our probiotics. So we had about a 50% reduction. With E. coli 0157H7, we had 20% positive in our controls with the uh, monensin and tylosin treatment, 10%, and we had no positive samples in our probiotic treatment. So we found a positive impact on the pathogen prevalence. We then took our uh, enterococcus isolates and looked for multi-drug resistance. Multi-drug resistance defined as three or more antibiotics. And, uh, our controls, we had our, our, our monensin tylosin, which had both the ionophore and the tylosin, so really two subtherapeutic antibiotics. We had almost 70% of our isolates, uh, had, or 70% of our uh, enterococcus isolates were multidrug resistant. Our controls, which had no subtherapeutic antibiotics, they had about 28% uh, resistance in this case. And then our uh, monensin probiotic treatment was around 48%. So we had some reduction, and it was somewhere between the no subtherapeutic antibiotic treatment and then the full subtherapeutic antibiotic treatment. We also looked at generic E. coli as an indicator of gram negatives. And in this case, we actually found that our control, uh, which had no subtherapeutic antibiotics, and our probiotic treatments were similar in the multidrug resistance. Uh, with regard to uh, alleviating that, there is this gives us some evidence. We, we're doing further studies on this, but that we can maybe have some mitigation of that uh, Re emergence of resistance with this particular uh, probiotic. We did look at the performance and carcass characteristics in this study. Uh, really, uh, there were no differences um, uh, across the three treatments. The, the body weight, the average daily gain was similar. Our carcass weight, dressing percentage, all of the, the meat quality at, uh, aspects were similar. and. Everything was USDA choice or better. We had really nice cattle for this study. This is, uh, this is done by our ruminant nutrition group. And if anyone has great questions about that, our grad student who did the, the ruminant nutrition studies can answer those questions because I'm not a ruminant nutritionist. But I, I, do, I can explain the vinyl data. But anyway, so developing this next generation of probiotics, we did find that, again, we have reduced not only E. coli 0157H7, but salmonella in these samples. Uh, presence of the L28 with the monensin resulted in antibiotic resistant patterns similar to those fed no subtherapeutic antibiotics. So that's really a positive thing. And it is interesting, yes, the cattle fed no subtherapeutic antibiotics did have some level of multidrug resistance, but we're all microbiologists, or most of us, and we kind of can explain that and understand that. Um, and also, the supplementation did not have any negative impacts on performance of the animal. So that's where we are with that one. We'll continue to do studies with that particular strain. So I'm going to move into food applications. And uh, again, like I said before, you really need to select strains to do what you want to do uh, for a particular use. And in this case, uh, we developed a cocktail mixture of uh, MP51, 3, 7, and 28. And we can supplement at 10 to the 7 CFU per gram of ground beef. And uh, we had studies where we put the pathogens, both uh, E. coli, 0157H7, uh, 026, and 0111, salmonella, and salmonella and ground beef, and stored these at four degrees Celsius for five days. It's important to note that these were stored in a retail display case in packaged ground beef. And retail display cases, even if you set them at four degrees, you're going to have temperature cycles and, and, and various uh, degrees of temperature shifts. So we did get some growth of those in our in our different samples. So here is the, are the results on the salmonella in ground beef. So we started out at a low level. We wanted to kind of mimic what we might find in the supermarket. It's still a little higher, but uh, we put in a log of around 2 or 2.5. And over time, we did have about a one log increase in our controls, again, in the retail display case. We're not saying that salmonella grows 
at that temperature. But we had a significant reduction of those uh, with this combination of treatments in our ground beef samples. And then with E. coli, 0157H7, very similar trend. It started out about a log of 2.5. We did have growth, uh, a slight growth of one log over five days, but then we also had significant inhibition over five days with this, these four combinations of treatments. Uh, this is, uh, these, this combination of bacterial strains are listed on the USDA uh, approved additive list to be used as an intervention. The one drawback on this is that it does require labeling because there is a residual beneficial effect. So if it's used in ground beef, it would have to say ground beef with active cultures and there's various wording that is allowed on those labels. Oh, and then we also had our non-0157S tech, sorry, I did not present this data. Similar trend, we had an increase, but then um, after three days, we had significant reductions in the total uh, non-0157S techs that we evaluated. So with that, uh, we did ground beef and we did cattle. And so we have started looking at new applications uh, with the just different ways we can utilize these cultures. And one of the things, uh, one of the areas that has really grown for us is pet food. And we started looking at uh, pet kibble. And we did this because just in the past year, or the past several years, there have been many recalls and outbreaks associated with pet food. And, you know, pets can become contaminated and get sick, but also the pets themselves can become contaminated and make a, a person sick, especially children. And sometimes children actually eat the pet food, unfortunately, especially uh, pet kibble. And after being in a pet, many pet, pet food plants, um, I don't, I wouldn't recommend that. Not that it's bad. It's just <laughs> not my, would not be my favorite uh, food of choice. But anyway, so we wanted to make sure our pet food uh, was not a source of contamination. So we took commercially available uh, pet kibble and inoculated it with salmonella and treated it again with our L28. This is the same strain we were using in our cattle studies. Uh, we bagged it, stored it, at ambient temperature and we took samples at 0, 24, and 72 hours, uh, looked at the salmonella survival, and if we had no survivors, we went back and pre-enriched to make sure we actually killed everything. And what we found was at, uh, you know, zero hours, we started out about a 10 to the 6 of salmonella. After four hours, uh, we had some reduction of both, but more with our uh, L28 treated samples. After 24 hours, uh, we had about a four log reduction. But after 48 and 72 hours, we had complete elimination of our salmonella in the pet kibble. This was again confirmed by culturing, pre-enriching to make sure we did not have any low level survivors in the product. So very effective in the pet kibble. Uh, we then moved on to, uh, if you recall, we had really good results with our Listeria and we had some concern with our uh, stainless steel or, or we wanted to see if this would work in stainless steel to reduce Listeria in biofilms. So we did a study and put, uh, basically took stainless steel coupons inoculated at seven logs. And what we found was that, and we evaluated this against a commercially available strain, the FS56, and then our L28, and we found that after 24 hours, again, we had elimination of our listeria in stainless steel. And last of all, um, we're looking at chicken fat. Chicken fat is a rendered product, and with FSMA laws, this has been a big problem in many, uh, many rendering operations. We again inoculated it and added our L28. And we found that after three days, we had a seven log reduction in chicken fat. So there is really um, multiple applications of these different probiotic strains. 
Uh, I want to say in cautioning, uh, not one probiotic can do everything. I talked about many different strains. You have to select those uh, against, you have to make sure you carefully select and develop strains to get the desired results. Some products do not work. Uh, make sure that if you're doing some implant studies, you have to be very careful at interpreting results. Uh, whenever you're working with probiotics, you have to be sure that in your broth media that you're evaluating that the inhibition isn't happening in the media, that it's actually happening in the product or the animal because you're actually isolating not only the pathogen, but also the added probiotics. So you want to make sure the results you get are actually accurate. So be just work with qualified microbiologists if you're ever evaluating probiotics. So um, in conclusion, probiotics aren't a new technology. They've been around a long time, but some of the applications are new and uh, can be optimized for very specific needs. I uh, need to acknowledge I have many co-investigators, graduate students, funding agencies that really um, have supported the work over the years. And disclaimers, uh, definitely we have um, a, a company that does produce the L28 with uh, other scientists at Texas Tech. I have worked very closely with Nutrition Physiology who makes uh, the MP51 strain and so have to dis uh, have that disclaimer for the university and for y'all to know. So with that, I will take any questions. We know that probiotics are good for the animal's health and non-detrimental, but for certain downstream processes in meat and dairy, um, certain lactic acid bacteria are the bad guys for quality. Was that assessed ever? Yes, uh, absolutely. And uh, specifically with the combination of four strains that we put in ground beef, we uh, selected those strains that produced the antimicrobial properties but did not grow at refrigeration temperatures. So we made sure that it wasn't causing a spoilage problem. With all of these studies, uh, we have done long-term studies with uh, the product quality, the spoilage, the shelf life, and all of those things. There just simply wasn't time to present those data. But I'd be happy to, if you want to email me, I can provide some of that information for you. But you're absolutely right. They can create a problem with spoilage. That was pretty much my question. I was going to ask if it affected the flavor or appearance of anything that you... Uh, yeah, that's all, that was one of the characteristics we evaluated. Uh, even with the pet food, we've done uh, dog food feeding trials where we had made sure that the dogs did not affect the flavor or the, the acceptability of the dog food. So did you look um, at mechanism... Uh, any, uh, you know, what exactly these strains are doing that's different from other lactic acid bacteria? We have done a very basic amount of mechanism work. Uh, obviously, pH, we get uh, the L28 produces a PA, low pH very rapidly within six hours compared to um, other cultures which may take 12 to 18 hours to get the same pH. We know there are some uh, bacteriosin-like substances, but we have not done a great amount of work on determining the exact mechanism. For your stainless steel uh, coupon study, how was the L28 applied? To the coupons? Uh, it was simply uh, dipped onto the coupons. After First we attached the listeria and we had a method to form the biofilms on that and then it was it was actually, no that's not correct, we put them in wells and the, in the wells we added the L28 to the wells and let it kind of grow together uh, with the stainless steel. So it was in constant contact, it wasn't just like sprayed on? No it was not, not in this case. And yeah. what, what's the pH of the L28? It will go down to, I believe, 3.2 3 or so. David, do you know the exact pH? He's 3.5, so yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question. That's a very interesting presentation. Thank you so much. Um, my question is, um, uh, I saw you done some research on the ground beef. I'm wondering, like, uh, what uh, the person uh, asked to, um, previously. Uh, have you followed the pH of the ground beef? Uh, also, for the initial inoculum of the um, lactic, lactic acid bacteria, I'm wondering the initial inoculum level. Um, 
because I, um, I think for the protective culture, probably it's uh, also kind of uh, those dependent. Um, so my third question would be, uh, have you compared the effect of those protective cultures on gram-positive bacteria like uh, uh, Listeria and the E. coli O157? Which one is more significant? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so question one was pH. Yes, we did measure the pH of the ground beef, and, and there is a publication on that. Uh, there were no changes in the pH of the ground beef over the five-day period. Uh, the second question, there we did a dose response study. Uh, the, the approved USDA dose of that, the, where it was most effective, is 10 to the 7. Uh, total bacteria, a combination of the four per gram, and so that's what's needed for the effect. And we have not looked at listeria or, or other gram-positive bacteria. Oh, sorry. So the ino uh, initial inoculum level is about 10 to, 10 to 7? Sorry. Yes, 10 to the 7 uh, per gram of ground beef. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Um, Mine's a quick question. Um, Thank you for the presentation, very interesting. Um, I just wonder if you know anyone that's doing similar work on these um, sprouts that people do, you make sprouts and then you make a final product and say, yeah, it's probiotic. Because I have not found any work that shows how those relate with pathogenic strains and I worry. Uh, yes, we are actually doing work on sprouts. The focus on this was more meat and poultry type products, but yet we have similar data on sprouts. David, do you want to wave? Because David uh, Campos, our grad student, has done quite a bit of work on that and has data on that, and we can share some of that as well. So. Uh, for E. coli L157 in cattle, the actual cattle treatment, we know obviously where the bacteria colonize, specifically the terminal rectum mainly. Um, so how do you, do you know mechanistically what it's, it's doing there? Is it actually occupying that space, and, um, or is it you know, some other part of the gut. I mean, just interesting how that's really going to work when it's yeah. such a specific site. We have done, uh, in the study I just mentioned, we are still in the process of analyzing the gut tissue to see if there were changes in the gut, adhesion, uh, the, the health of the microvilli, all of those different things. In our previous studies with the first culture, uh, we looked at uh, the same things and we really didn't get a colonization or occupation of any of the sites in those animals. It was more of a direct uh, competitive inhibition as opposed to occupying those sites where they would colonize. So. So what, in, in the rumen or just throughout the gut? Uh, no, no, no. The, well, we did the rectoanal junction, you mm -hmm. know, which is where we can isolate a lot of it. And then we also did other sections of the GI tract. But no, not in the rumen. We did not look there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay.